one time I asked a bishop to impose hands on this one woman and he did and she said when he put his hands on her head and started praying to drive the demon out she said the pain that she experienced which is basically the pain that the demon's experiencing because the person's experiencing the same pain she said was worse than childbirth hey my friends we're really privileged to have with us uh, once again father chad ripperger as you know an exorcist who has been very involved in making the public face of uh, exorcists. In other words, making exorcists public, sort of taking the place, if you will, of Father Gabriel Amorth, who was the chief exorcist in Rome for a long, long time. It's so great to have him with us, and you're definitely going to want to stay tuned to this episode. Mighty nations stumble, world war threatens. There's destruction on the battlefield and also in the womb. And all this is happening because man has forgotten God. Pope Pius XI said, Men must look for the peace of Christ in the kingdom of Christ. And he urged that the faithful give public honor to Christ the King so that individuals and states would submit once more to the rule of their Savior. And that is why LifeSite News is raising up the image of Christ the King across the United States. Our billboards have already proclaimed the rule of our divine Savior to tens of thousands of Americans, and you can help us reach millions more. Only when Christ the King reigns over our hearts and our minds will there be peace among nations and peace in our homes. Please pledge your support today for these billboards at lifefunder.com slash Christ is King. Father Ripperger, so good you could be with us. Thank you for having me. So let's begin as we always do, sign of the cross. Father, if you could lead us, please. Sure. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Now, Father, your role as an exorcist is a very interesting one. You've been very, very public regarding exorcism and the role of exorcists. Before you was Father Gabriel Amorth, who I believe brought about a time when more people knew or got associated with or knew more about what's going on in the world of exorcism than at any other time before in history. And you've sort of continued in that noble tradition. And you've at least in the public perception, have taken on much of the mantle of being a public spokesman for exorcism and being the reality of exorcism, of course. And it must be somewhat daunting to be in that role. But uh, what's your take on it, Father? I consider Father Amorth kind of like the father, although Father Candido maybe is is the, the grandfather, but Father Amorth was like the father of modern day exorcists because he became the foundation, even when I was studying this material, became the initial foundation. And then from there, I branched out and did a number of different things. But what I realized what he was actually doing when I was reading his book, I saw the value in the fact that he was doing two things. One is, is that he was informing people of the reality of the diabolic, but also this is how spiritual this is the complexion and this is how spiritual warfare works it's a structured battle if you understand what to do and what not to do etc then you can keep yourself protected keep your family protected and so i was uh, observing that and then um the other thing is too is which is something which i've tried to do in his same vein is there are times when i will talk about things that have happened in session but never for their own sake. It's always as a catechetical point. And that was something that I noticed that he did. And so I saw that what he was using this is as a form of kind of, not, not evangelization, but of catechesis for us to actually know. And so what I began to realize too is, is that even though Father Morris' work was out there, a, a large part of the people simply did not n have a knowledge of how spiritual warfare was working and as a priest and even as an exorcist. But even before as I was an exorcist, I just noticed that a lot of people were getting kind of mopped up in the spiritual battle with because they didn't know even just elementary things to do. And if we would just educate them, then that would actually um, help us. So I initially didn't want to be known as an exorcist. In fact, I operated as an exorcist for a, a number of years before I even um, stepped out onto the public scene. But it, and, and even then, I only did it really as a catechetical thing. And it's only became much, you know, it became about 10 or 15 years after that, that I actually started talking openly about, okay, these are sessions, this is what happens in possession and things like that. But otherwise it was primarily to educate people on that. So I see it as kind of as an obligation as a priest who's knowledgeable in this area in order to catechize people. So in this kind of an ironic sort of way, 
being an exorcist is uh in in when people hear that you're an exorcist you either get one of two reactions or they're like wow that's amazing you know and then they they basically believe everything you say which they they shouldn't they should only believe in Christ, when everything the christ in the church says but on the other hand, then you'll get people who just dismiss you altogether and think you're just a complete nutcase. So I, I kind of look at it as I look at it as indifferent. I, if it does allow me to open up people's hearts for me to be able to talk to them about the reality of church teaching or what the what's the complexion of spiritual warfare is, then I'm willing to accept it. But otherwise, I don't pay too much attention to it. But what you just said there, Father, is so important, the catechetical value of being able to teach people, as it were, the rules of engagement, how to engage in battle with demons. That's so important. If you had to, or if somebody asked you, what are the top three rules of engagement? Because, I mean, as a father of a family who, you know, if you believe in the divine and in the spiritual realities, you'll know that there's satanic activity directed yeah. at your family. It's evident. Yeah. If, if you've lived long enough in family life, you know that. So what are the few tips you could give, especially fathers, let's say, because they're supposed to be the head of the household as fathers. What are the top rules of engagement? Well, the top three, I would probably say, are first and foremost, just lead a normal Catholic life. And by normal, I mean getting to confession, getting to Mass on Sundays and holy obligations, but getting to confession on a regular basis, receiving the sacraments, doing your prayers, which the church has all said. So just leading a normal Catholic life, making use of the sacramental. So if you just do that, that itself is going to be one of the principal ways to keep yourself protected. And this is one of the ways that the, the fathers can inoculate their children, is getting them to, in, to have a true love for the Catholic faith and the practice of the Catholic faith. The second one is, I call it staying in your lane, the authority structure of who has rights and who doesn't to give commands. It's infused in their minds. They have absolute clarity about it. So they know exactly what the demarcation are regarding who has authority and who doesn't. So I always tell people, just stay in your lane. Don't go praying over other people. You can pray for other people and you can ask our Lord to help people if you think they're under diabolic attack, but don't be praying you're trying to command the demons to leave them if you don't have authority, whereas parents do, etc. So just stay in your lane, because we found if you stay in your lane, the retaliation is very much minimized. And also, because authority is to provide and to protect, it also means that if you, as long as people stay in the authority structure, then they're going to be protected. And then the last one um, is something that we've really kind of notice it's a matter of maintaining discipline in your spiritual life. In other words, there has to be some area of your spiritual life where you're practicing self-denial every single day in the practice of it. And if we do, if they do that consistently, then we find they're generally speaking immune from diabolic influence. In fact, what we have found is, is that about 80% not including possession so much, but in lower forms of diabolic influence, we've noticed that about 80% of those evaporate once people just develop basic interior discipline in their spiritual life. And so those are the three, I would say. One of the things you mentioned there, I think is very, very important. You said parents do have authority. Can you spell that out for us a little bit, please? Right. So all the way from the time of the Old Testament, all the way up until new, in fact, the authors actually say it's part of a natural law. Because children are born to the parents, the parents have a natural law right over determination regarding certain um, uh, aspects in relationship to the children's lives. That authority over them, um, that authority is to provide and to protect. So the providence, the protection is both material in the sense that, for example, the, the father has a right to protect his children from say, a, an intruder into the house, but he also that therefore has a right to protect him spiritually. And so the father actually has the right to command the demons to leave his children alone because he has authority over his wife. He has the right to command the demons to leave. The wife actually, or the mother has the right to command the demons to leave the children because she has authority over them, etc. So in my book called Diabolic Influence, I, there's an 80 page chapter. It's literally 80 pages on the authority structure. And the reason I go into it is because in the spiritual warfare, the authority structure is absolutely everything because the demons, it's all about power. So once you understand the authority structure, then you can make use of it. But in there, I parse out who actually has authority and who doesn't. So the parents actually have that part from the natural law to basically command the demons to leave their children alone. And the husband to tell him to leave his wife alone. That's right. 
And in the context of that, I talk in the book, I talk about there's three different kinds of rights in relationship to commanding the demons to leave. The one is um, the natural law, just a natural law right over our own body. So, for example, I can command the demons to leave me alone because of the fact that this is my body and the fact that they're attacking it. They have no right over this. They have permission, but they don't have any rights. So I can tell them, hey, leave me alone. And that's why any layman can actually command this. This was actually um, there have been some priests who say, no, lay people don't have the right to command demons. That's actually not not true. So if you actually read, there's a book called Moral and Pastoral Theology by um, McEwen Callan. It was probably one of the top moral theology books in English before the council. And in there, um, it's like paragraph uh, 2556 about, they talk about, no, the lay people actually do have a right to command demons to leave in relationship to themselves. And then the other one is by office. So the natural law offices of father and husband, and then mother, uh, in relationship to the children. So they actually have those. And then the last one is by duty. And this would be something. So for example, the fact that I have obligations to take care of my mother, for example, gives me, and not just as a priest, but even as a son, gives me the right to command the demons to leave her alone because I have obligations to her. And so those are the three ways in which that would actually happen. So, and in relationship to marriage, the wife has rights over the husband's body by virtue of the marital contract. And so she can command the demons to leave, even though she doesn't have authority over her husband in that same manner. Very interesting. So that brings up another question, because does it also apply to uh, demons somehow involved in attacking not only persons, but things? And so can the owner of a business, for instance, is able to command the demons to leave his business? Yes, he does. Only over those things which he owns. So he doesn't have the ability to do it in relationship to his employees. He does have the ability to command the demons to leave his building and to leave the, leave his business alone. He does have that. Um, but then he would have to petition our Lord to ask to ask our Lord or our Lady to drive the demons out in relationship to his employees. But he but he does have the authority over his what he actually owns. Wow. That's fascinating. So what one of the other aspects that uh, is very interesting here, I heard you say it once before, it's about the power of a bishop in terms of exorcism. So there are priests um, that are in a way all exorcists, I think. Uh, yes, technically speaking, that's correct. And then there's the bishop more so, or how does that work? So basically, uh, the bishop is technically speaking the mandated exorcist of the diocese by virtue of his office. Since the Council of Trent... Uh, the uh, order of exorcist. So as soon as you become a deacon in the new rite, but in the old rite, you receive the order of exorcist. But once you become a deacon in the old rite, in the new rite, then you actually, would, which would also contain all the lower orders. So you actually have all those lower orders. So you actually are an exorcist as a priest or as even as a deacon, technically speaking, but it's what we call a potest legata. It's a bound power. Since the Council of Trent, the church has restricted the doing of exorcisms over the lay people um, strictly to the clergy, that is specifically to priests alone. So not even, um, even if you receive the order of exorcist, you can't, in, you can't employ it because the church has bound that power. And so, um, but the priest, even he can do minor exorcisms. So, for example, he could just, you know, impose hands on somebody's head and mentally command the demon to leave the person, something like that. But to do solemn exorcisms, he has to have permission from his local bishop because the bishop is the exorcist of the diocese and then he can delegate it to the priest. Is there not also something about a bishop having more power somehow uh, in terms of an exorcism? He could do more than, than even yourself, like an official exorcist? Yeah, that's correct. So because he has the fullness of the priesthood and also because of the fact that he has jurisdiction over his diocese, his the power that he exercises due to his authority as the bishop is far more extensive than it is to a priest. So uh, I'll give you an example. One time hmm. I asked um, a bishop to impose hands on this one woman and um, he did. And she said when he put his hands on, on her head and started praying, to drive the demon out, she said the pain that she experienced, which is basically the pain that the demon's experiencing, because the person's experiencing the same pain, 
she said was worse than childbirth. That type of thing doesn't happen in relationship to to myself. So this is an indicator that the bishops, um, their their power is much more extensive in relationship to that. So it, it's not just in relationship to casting the demons out, but it's even in relationship to keeping the, the their dioceses protected. So one of the books I'm actually I'm going to write here once I finish the I'm working on another book, but one of the books is just going to be a short book, like 60 pages, and the title of it is called The Power of a Bishop. Most bishops don't have a clue how powerful they are. Even when bishops are bad bishops, the demons have a tremendous loathing and hatred for them because of their position and power that they actually have in the context of the spiritual warfare. So, for example, the bishop, he determines what graces flow into the church, into his diocese by what devotions he promotes, what he permits, what uh, what liturgical stuff he permits, how he enacts liturgical laws in his uh, or policies in his particular diocese, but then also in relationship to the diabolic influence, he has the power to exercise his diocese every single day and literally drive the demons out of the diocese, and it won't affect just the Catholics. It's going to affect everybody in the territory. And so if the bishops were doing that on a more regular basis, now they have to be, they have to be spiritually up to snuff. They've got to have their own spiritual life in order. But if they were doing that, I personally believe, and this is maybe it's, it's just an opinion of mine, that if they started doing that, that even the political situations in their diocese would begin to shift. And so because the demons would have less impact or less influence in those particular situations. That's amazing. And and would that then also uh, sort of translate up to the Pope? Yeah, it does. Not so much because of the fact every bishop is like the Pope in the sense that they have the fullness of the priesthood by being a bishop. He has the fullness of jurisdiction of the whole church. And so because of that particular power of jurisdiction, then he's even he has even more power in relationship to um, being able to cast demons out. I've never heard of a bishop doing like a daily exorcism like of his diocese or even remotely something like that. You don't have to name any names, but do you know of any bishop who is doing this yet? Um, not daily, although there could be a couple of them that are doing it daily. I do know that there were some that were doing it. There was a few of them um, that started doing it uh, weekly. Um, or, and there were also some that were um, doing it because of particular issues that had risen in their diocese and they realized this was diabolic. They were doing actual minor exorcisms in order to kind of drive the demons out of their diocese. So there were some, but it's to, to my knowledge, I don't know for certain, but to my knowledge, it's just a small handful. When people hear that you are an exorcist, there are likely some who say, you know, you don't really believe in all that, do you? You don't really believe that people can you know, levitate or fly and like we see in the movies. If people just say, you know, what do you say to someone? Because I actually had this at the University of Tulsa. This one guy asked me, he said, well, what do you say to someone like myself who doesn't believe that any of this stuff is real? And I said, I don't have that luxury to be able to disbelieve it or not believe it. I'm dealing with it every single day. This is actually what one of the things that I find so fascinating, because everyone says, well, these are just all psychological problems. Well, it's not so much now because of the fact that we get people from literally all over the world coming to us for help. But before then, a majority of my cases were being referred to me by psychologists because they were seeing things that they're like, that is not a psychological problem. So the fact that they would, and we actually even saw this in um, Indiana, Father, I think it was Father Lampert, in fact, had the case where the kid was in the hospital. The hospital staff was seeing the kid run up the side of the walls backwards, right? And then you had people levitating and things like that. Now, do these happen in, in all cases? No, they only happen in about five to seven percent of the cases where you're going to see those kinds of things happening, but they still are real. They still do exist. You know, when you see it, people say, well, what is this as an exorcist? What do you think about that? And I'm just like, well, it's part of the landscape. After a while, you begin to realize he's just doing that for show. And so I don't tolerate it. I clamp down on them. So I don't see a whole lot of that stuff. I mean, once I still do from time to time, but I just don't let them get away with that kind of stuff because they're just trying to be showmen and they're just trying to distract you. Don't take my word for it. Take the psychologists and take the medical um, healthcare professionals who are seeing this stuff from time to time. Even people who are working in mental institutions are seeing things and they'll come up to me and say, I, this is what I'm seeing. Is this, is this diabolic? I'm like, yeah, it is. And it's not psychological. Now, sometimes you can't make, you can't discern whether it's one or the other, but there are some things that are clearly outside of a human being's capacity to do. And that's what you tend to see from time to time. 
one of the things we're seeing or getting into now, at least in today's day and age, there seems to be an appreciation for kind of weird manifestations. People think, oh, that's that's cool. The person is able to or in control, uh, they have some kind of power or magic. Have you seen that yet? Or perhaps you wouldn't be seeing that much because you'd be dealing with those people who want out rather than those who want to use it to for gain or or whatever they want to use it for. Yeah, that's correct. Usually we, we the, the only time you will see somebody who's actually doing it for power's sake and they, that they want to do those kinds of things, uh, or at some time, and this is also the, the same principles apply to someone who's perfectly possessed. You will only mm -hmm. see those types of people uh, if they're trying to take you out as an exorcist, because they'll, um, and the re because if they can take you out, then it's a, a form of empowerment for them. Whereas most of the people we, and I don't see those types of people because we have a whole process that people have to go through before they can see us and they get vetted out very quickly because there's certain traits that you see among those people and you can pick them out pretty quickly. So we see the people that just authentically want help. Okay. And so we don't tend to see those people too often. You're in a neat place, Father. You're in a place where you get to see much of the spiritual reality. So. Most people, they have lives where they don't really see any manifestation of the, the realities, really, of, of faith and, and spiritual life and or any kind of power outside the normal. So faith becomes an exercise of having to believe, and it's, it's like blind faith, if you will. But the miraculous or supernormal isn't part of their normal lives. What does that do to you? Because you get to see it. This is... What has it done for you in terms of being exposed to it so much? Is it a very different thing than for almost anybody else, for sure? Yeah, that's true. I one time jokingly said to a friend of mine, I said, you know, being an exorcist is basically getting to have a mystical life without being a saint. Because you you, you tend to see so many different things. Uh, what it does is, um, I think one of the best descriptions was by a, an exorcist in Rome. He said, it's the Christian life writ large. And by that, he was meaning that you see the reality of the church's teachings regarding these things. So, for example, every single demon, there is some point of Catholic doctrine, which was the point of his fall. Right. And so you begin to learn the, the the demons themselves gives testimony to the truths of the Catholic faith in forms of clarity that you just it's hard to even hear human beings of the of the mm. highest caliber express it with those kinds of that kind of clarity. But also the very fact that the demon his conviction that because he was infused that this was a particular point of doctrine um, that he had in relationship to um, what God was asking him regarding his task, and he rejected it. And so this is the thing that he hates or that he attacks or what have you. And so you start to learn those particular, uh, learn about, um, you get much clarity because this thing, it's it's manifesting in a preternatural way, it's something that human beings can't do. It's talking in a voice, the person, it's, or it's using languages that the person doesn't know. And this thing is talking about things with it, about the Catholic faith that gives um, absolute clarity to some of these things. Like, you know, I, for example, let me just give you an example. The demon Isis, yeah, it's a real demon. There's a demon named Isis. He fell because he could not accept the mm. mercy that Christ would have for human beings. And so he was the one, one of the most vicious, one of the most cruel demons that you can ever deal with. And so you begin to realize, um, uh, you know, how important the mercy of Christ is and how true it is and, and the reality of it. So it gives you a sense of the true, the reality of these things in a level that you normally wouldn't otherwise. Amazing. Father, you've been so generous with your time. If people want to learn more about what you do, learn more about exorcism and how to defend themselves against attacks from the evil spirits, where should they go? What resources uh, would you suggest? If they're lay people, there's a book that I wrote called Dominion. Um, it's a long book. It's a hard book to read. But if you get through it, it'll give you the whole structure and give you a sense of how all this stuff works. And also so the things that you can do in order to um, keep yourself protected and also to ward off diabolic attack. If you're a priest, there's a priest version called The Nature and Psychology of Diabolic Influence. You can contact us at um, my website, Census Traditions. 
Um, or you can even go to our website, but if you go to then, cause you can't buy it unless um, you get a, it's on a private link and a code, but that is for, um, uh, for priests. And then also mental health care professionals can also buy it because it gives the diagnostic material um, about how you can discern between something that's psychological and something that's diabolic. So those, those were the, be the two places I'd recommend. That's beautiful father. Well, I want to thank you so much for, uh, for your, all your time. Um, any thought, final thoughts? thoughts for us uh, before we let you go. Just lead a good, solid Catholic life because that's your best inoculation against diabolic influence. Father Chad Ripperger, thank you so much for being with us. If you wouldn't mind giving us a final blessing. Sure. Benedictio Dei Omnipotentis, Patris et Fili et Spiritus Super Vos, Sit Manit Semper. Amen. God bless you, Father. Thank you. Thank you and God bless to all of you. And we'll see you next time.